You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast. Our mission is really simple. It is to give African retail and institutional investors fast, secure access to the global and local investment options that allows them to reach for their financial goals. We really over-index on education, on providing materials, information, insights that allow people to understand what to do. Unfortunately, we're somewhat locked out from benefiting from all that growth, even though we're contributing to it, right? When we got started, no one was doing this. So the first question was why is no one doing this? Is there regulation against Africans owning assets in markets outside Africa? Africa, Africa? Stay tuned as we bring you inspiring people who are unlocking Africa's economic potential. You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast with your host, Tessa Adamu. Welcome to the Unlocking Africa podcast, where we find amazing people who are doing amazing things to unlock Africa's economic potential. Today, we have Richmond Bassi, who is CEO and founder of Bamboo, which is a wealth tech platform that enables Africans to buy US stocks. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the podcast, Richmond. How are you? Thank you, Tessa. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. As usual, I like to start from the beginning. So I was hoping you could introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about Richmond Bassey. <laughs> well, my name is Richmond Bassey, uh, the co-founder, CEO of Bamboo. By training, I'm an engineer and I went to school in London, studied mechanical engineering, also studied innovation and management I mean, my master's, and then I moved back to Lagos uh, almost immediately after. And I've been working um, across specifically the tech ecosystem. Started out working while I was in London as a product manager, an analyst, a product manager, you know, working in product teams. Moved back to Lagos, worked as a VC uh, for a while, and then I moved back to work in a startup and then went on to to start Bamboo after that, but primarily just an engineer that has a passion for building things. Um, and I translated that passion into my work through my entire career. Fantastic. Thank you for that. So you've given us great insight into who you are, engineer, innovator, and how you've used those skills to transition into the world of tech, which has led you to Bamboo. So can you tell us a bit more about Bamboo and its mission? Well, at Bamboo, our mission is really simple, and it is to give African retail and institutional investors fast, secure access to the global and local investment options that allows them to reach for their financial goals and build for their future. And, and that's an, a very important part of it. It's helping you know individuals and institutions, especially individuals, to reach for their financial goals and build for their future because people have a lot of goals that they want to meet. And many of them are financial. They have something to do with money. Um, but how do they do this? How do they get to you know buying the dream house that they want, buying the dream car that they want, or just having a better relationship with money. Our, our mission is to give the access and all the tools that is needed and the education that is needed to do that. So that's really our mission at Bamboo. So you've detailed the mission is to give access to build and reach financial goals. So I was hoping we can go into a bit more detail regarding specifically how do you help Africans build and reach their financial goals in terms of long-term wealth through investing in U.S. stocks? That's a very good question. Um, I think the first thing we do, Tessa, is education, right? And what we find is a lot of people in our market in Africa need to be educated about finances, about money, about wealth, about investing. So our initial approach is that we want to educate people. We want to give information because education and insight empowers people. It gets them to think, oh, wow, so that's possible, right? It helps them to understand what to do. So we really over-index on education, on providing materials, information, insights that allow people to understand you know, what to do. Um, and naturally, the next thing that we do if we have educated someone is to then give them the platform, um, the tools 
that allow them to be able to do that. So first thing that we have is our product, the Bamboo app, which gives you instant access to the U.S. stock market to be able to buy um, and sell, you know, stocks of U.S. companies. And we also provide on that service, we provide ETFs and ADRs, American Deposit Receipts, and ETFs, exchange traded funds. And these are just also types of instruments that are sold on the exchange. But as well, we do provide, uh, we launched a new product uh, sometime last year called Fixed Returns, which is basically a fixed deposit account that allows you earn a fixed amount um, on an annual basis or depending on the tenor that you want to lock your monies for. Uh, again, it's just giving you options, right? If you want to take a risk and invest in an asset class that has some risk attached to it uh, or the stock market risk attached to it, principle is not assured or guaranteed, then you can do that. But if you also want to be less risky and protect your principle and get a return, provide that. Our goal at the end of the day is that no matter the type of investor that you are, no matter the type of risk appetite that you have, you should be able to use Bamboo to organize your wealth creation journey, your investment journey. Fantastic. So you've mentioned there are some areas such as education, the fixed return service that you offer, also providing access to US capital markets via the app. So maybe we can elaborate on the app WealthTech. How do you feel that WealthTech has opened up US capital markets to Africans or people on the continent? Oh, no, absolutely. It has. I think now, because of Bamboo, as a Nigerian, you can, in one, two, three minutes, open a brokerage account in the US. You can fund that account from your local bank account or your local cards and instantly access stocks that you probably want to buy, like Apple, Google, um, Tesla, or perhaps there's a new IPO that's happening in the market. You can instantly access it from the comfort of your home, right in Lagos, in your lucky house, you can, you can do this. And this is something that was previously not possible. Um, but now the entire wealth of the U.S. stock market, that's a financial engine that is, you know, has a good reputation for making, you know, people rich and making, for spinning out millionaires, um, is now available to Nigerians, now available to Africans at large. And, and I think that's pretty powerful because when you think about it, Nigeria, Africa is a huge market for a lot of the global goods and services that, you know, that we consume. We consume a lot of um, of services that are available in the, in the U.S. markets that underpins the growth, you know, of the global economy. But unfortunately, we're somewhat locked out from benefiting from all that growth, even though we're contributing to it, right? For example, Facebook is a huge service that a lot of Africans consume, whether to connect with friends and family, whether to connect with businesses, groups, um, and now even the metaverse. Uh, but if, if when Facebook IPO'd in 2009, I believe, it was impossible as a Nigerian to be able to buy buy that stock instantly. Uh, but now we've made that possible. And that's what, you know, the type of possibilities that we've brought into the investment journey for any every typical African. You can, from the comfort of your home, uh, participate in the global financial markets with ease and with comfort and without any stress at all. And I think that that's such a pretty powerful thing, right? Um, because yes. you can enjoy all that gains and all that growth in your personal finances and your personal wealth and your personal investment journey. Fantastic. So from what you've said, it's quite clear that you've made access easy and seamless for your users. So how many active users do you currently have on the platform and what have been some of the strategies that you've used to acquire these users? Um, we have about just under 700,000 accounts. Um, and we just crossed our 100,000 milestone. So we have over 100,000 funded accounts on Bamboo now. And that's pretty exciting because that was a milestone we crossed last month. And really, our strategy for acquiring and maintaining these accounts or these users, or because these are actually real people, is education. Again, like I mentioned in the start, we very much over-index on providing education, right? We want to make sure that 
you can start out with us as someone that knows nothing about investing and three months or six months down the line, you are a better and more confident investor because we show you, you know, how to buy your first stocks. We have webinars that we host for first time investors for how to buy your first stock. We have insights that we syndicate to more active investors on a maybe daily or weekly basis where we tell you what's happening in the markets. We give you, um, also sentiments. We also break down different sectors and the biggest players in the sectors and what is driving them. So you can think more broadly and think more confidently about your decision making. Because at best, Bamboo today is a self-directed platform. We, you know, the decisions we allow the users to make. Bamboo doesn't make any decisions on behalf of users. Um, so education is a pretty important thing for us. So we over-index on taking you on that, your investment journey. If you're just getting started, we have education guides and tools to help you get started on that journey. If you're already an existing investor, we investor, we have insights that we syndicate to you um, on a weekly basis. We even just also launched something called Learn by my co-founder launched this called Learn by Yamo which is, you know, following Yamo on her personal journey, her personal investment journey, um, and how she makes her own decisions. Again, over-indexing on making sure that we provide all the insights you need. Insights and education is one of the most powerful things for investing. Once you know what to do, um, you, you can take action. You can be more confident in your decisions. And that's what we want out of every one of our users. Um, And that's what keeps them staying with us. Fantastic. So if we look closely at your users, I'm not sure if you know this off the top of your head, but what are the demographics of your users in terms of age, income? Sure. Um, So (laughs) this is very interesting. So 60% of our users are millennials. And when you look at that, it then moves to the other 30% are Gen Zs. And that's very interesting. And then we have the other 10% split among boomers um, and Gen X's. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then when you even look at new account openings, right, more than 50% of the new accounts that are being opened are also Gen Z's. So we have a lot of new investors. We have a lot of, we think that a lot of our user base are young Africans that are just getting started with a career and just getting started with work or have been working a couple years. And it's interesting to see, and that gives me a lot of hope for the future of Africa. If we can continue on this trend to educate a lot of the young generation, I think in five, 10 years, we would see that the wealth of the individual African would probably be better. The education and the understanding of money um, by our generation, the generation coming after us will also, also be stronger. We do have... Um, Gen X's and baby and boomers on on the platform. Um, And what we typically see is that a lot of the the, the story of of volume happens with our, you know, Gen Z and millennials audience and more of the value, the bigger chunks of average investment size goes to our boomers and Gen X's. So they have a higher average trade value naturally because obviously they are more liquid they yeah. you know in bigger sa- chunks of savings or have been working for for many years to so have cash put away but you know it's interesting to see that bamboo can be useful to both groups um even though a lot of the user base and most of them are young people millennials um the average person working a, a professional working in, in oil and gas or in finance or in tech across the continent And that's pretty exciting for us. Extremely insightful. So if we take a few steps back prior to acquiring these users, what were some of the challenges that you faced in the early stages of establishing the platform? I think um, in getting started, the biggest challenges that we have faced and still face and obviously now manage better I mean, when we got started, no one was doing this. So the first question was, why is no one doing this? Is there regulation against Africans owning assets in markets outside Africa? Um, And we had to get a lot of opinions, legal opinions from lawyers, both locally and abroad to understand that, hey, are we doing something that is legal, right? And first thing we found that it was not illegal for Africans to own assets outside you know, the local market. So why has no one built for this, right? Why did no one have conviction to say, hey, we can bridge that gap between the local market and the global markets for Africans? And I think, I guess that's where our opportunity came um, and we took it, right? Um, and then also just 
the education component, right? It's it's a lot to to try to provide. You know, I mean, finance in itself sounds mysterious. It's a bit daunting as a as a subject. The money the money subject is something that a lot of people don't like to to have conversations about, right? So it's taking almost something that is very complex, something that is almost anxiety inducing, and simplifying it and figuring out ways to deliver it in bite sizes in ways that can be actionable to an entire market. So figuring that out, I think that's why I must give a big shout out to our incredible team at Bamboo because we've done a great job uh, figuring out those two things, figuring out you know, our relationship with regulators. And um, even though that's been an almost somewhat turbulent journey because of the nature of the business that we, we run and also educating users, being able to educate a wide base of users. I think two years ago, we ran one of the largest, in fact, the largest investment event in Africa that had thousands of investors connected online over a three-day period, listening to different speakers talk about money and talk about um, how to invest. And I think that was pretty powerful. Thank you for that. I believe that you also faced a major challenge of your bank account being frozen by the Central Bank of Nigeria in 2021. What were some of the learnings or insights you gained from this experience? I think the biggest learning for us there was that regulation plays a crucial role for wealth tech and for our type of business. And the biggest component in that is just educating regulators. And it so happens that, you know, in our type of business, our type of market, innovation precedes or have moved faster than what the, you know, what the regulation looks like, right? I I don't think uh, before we started our Local regulation contemplated Nigerians investing in the global market at scale, right? What does this look like? What does a broker that is onboarding Africans or Nigerians at scale, you know, and investing in a different market, what does that look like? What does regulation for that look like? And the education and the understanding of how this works has been, you know, historically where the disconnect has been. Um, But what we've learned is that Engaging regulators, providing the understanding of how our technology works, how our platform works, what the benefits to the economy is, what the benefits to the average user is, is what has been the game changer. Because at the end of the day, the relationship that operators like ourselves should have with regulators is a very enabling relationship because regulation ought to enable operators, enable innovation, right? And but when you look at the heart of it, what regulators really are concerned about is positive things, consumer protection, making sure that um, we operate in ways that are fair, transparent, and clear and not misleading. They want to ensure that there's market stability so they can prevent, you know, manipulations of the market, scams and frauds. Um, We also consume and collect a lot of data, personal data on individuals. They want to make sure that, you know, there's a lot of robust security measures to prevent clients' data from, you know, cyber threats, um, there's also just maintaining proper operational standards uh, and all positive things, right? So we now approach regulation and our relationship with regulators from that positive standpoint where we show them, you know, how we are handling customer protection that, you know, Bamboo accounts have insurance up to $500,000 on cash and on, on assets. We show them our data processes and data policies and how it works within the organization. We show them all that we do to prevent fraud and to detect fraud early and to, you know, stop fraud from happening on, on the platform. And these are all the things that they're concerned about. So what has happened is that that education um, and that engagement with regulators has not allowed them now have a better relationship with us and, and working to help us get to our goals and also us helping them get the insights that they need to properly regulate the market. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's safe to say that a lot of companies would not have survived a similar situation. So would you say that that extreme situation has strengthened the way that you operate and the user trust? Absolutely has, I think. Um, Because one thing that we over-indexed on in that period was communication, communicating with our users, right? Once something happened, when we hear the news, um, it was important for us to let our users know that this is what is happening. Um, Let them know what we're doing to solve the issues and to engage with regulators. We also kept them updated when we had heard more information from regulators, when we had made progress and resolved the issues. So taking them on that journey was was interesting for us, was also an interesting learning curve. 
But what we found was that just communicating with users and letting them know that their monies are safe, um, nothing has happened that affects um, their use of the platform and nothing has happened that affects their ability to trade and none of that was affected was pretty empowering for our users. Um, and we've seen that our users stuck with us through the time, even though we saw that all of that negative sentiments in the market did affect investor conviction. All in all, we saw through it that our users stuck with us, right? Many of what drives our monthly transaction volumes today is repeat users, is users, not even the new ones that are coming, is the ones that have existed. So every month is almost the 80 to 20 type ratio between activity from um, repeat users, existing users, and activity from new users. And I think that's pretty powerful, right? Yes. Uh, but yeah, engaging your users and being transparent is really the key here. So you've emphasized the importance of building and maintaining relationship with regulators. So from a, I guess, broader perspective, how do you believe the relationship between, say, fintech companies, wealth tech companies in Africa and regulators will evolve over time or in the future? I think the regulators see that the future of the market depends on innovation and it depends on innovative operators taking on you know, risk in a very healthy way and taking on problem solving and providing solutions that deepen the market. What regulators want is a deeper market. They want more liquidity in the market. They want more investors, more participation, more local retail participation. Um, and all of this would only come when operators take on the hard problems and try to solve them. Uh, and I understand I, you know, from engaging with our local regulators that this is the future that they see and this is the future that they want. And in order to achieve that type of future, it's only natural that the relationship has to be an enabling one, a relationship that empowers, right? Regulators empowering operators, um, giving them the, the platform that they need uh, to be able to test out new innovation. I know that the Nigerian SEC has announced, you know, several sandboxes to test uh, different types of innovation. And I think that's welcomed, in, you know, things that are welcome from a, from an operator standpoint so that you can take the things that you're doing. You have the regulatory backing that you need. Um, and, and that also is a very strong signal to users and to the market that, hey, whatever this innovation is that you're exploring or testing is safe. Regulators have purview over what the activities of the operators. And it's a win-win for everybody. Markets get deeper, markets get you know, wider, markets is infrastructure is established. And we just see that the future looks brighter in, in, in that type of a relationship. Um, and that's what I think. I think that the relationship now is such somewhat that regulators are open. There are many forums uh, where you know, that serve now as melting points for operators and regulators to discuss and solve issues and, and raise concerns where they apply. Um, so I see that that, that will continue to happen, um, especially as there's a lot happening in Africa and a lot of changes happening. And, and I think despite the challenges, the future is bright. And, and because we have operators solving these problems and regulators supporting, I think there's a bright future here. That's great to hear. I was hoping we can go back to something that you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation. You mentioned that Bamboo has launched a fixed income product called Fixed Return. I was hoping you could provide some details on this product and I guess how it fits into Bamboo's overall product development strategy. Yes, yeah, sure. Fixed Return is really just a fixed deposit account that returns up to 8% on an annual basis when you lock your cash with us. And there's also other tenors for three months, six months, nine months. And what that just helps our users do is, many times our users have a delta between you know, doing their research um, and deciding on positions that they want to take in the market, right? But then they have money sitting on their wallets that's not doing anything. Sometimes that process can take three months before a user decides, okay, this is a position I want to take, right? So we have provided a product that allows you just pack your cash and put your cash to work, right? Um, there are also other users that are also less risk averse and want to just um, invest in a way that they get their principal assured because investing in the stock market, capital is not guaranteed. Um, yesterday's price doesn't guarantee you know tomorrow's price. So you need to invest in the stock market with insight, with education, with some knowledge about what you're doing. 
Uh, and that process is a learning process for many. Um, so we provided fixed return as a way to complement our stocks product and give our users diversity, to ability to diversify their portfolio. And I think that's what is important to be able to, you know, whether whatever market conditions, you know, are in the public markets or what's happening in the local economy, you can, you can hedge, you know, against different factors. You can also grow your money in a healthy way. So that's what we've been able to achieve. And we've seen that since we launched, you know, fixed returns. I think the portfolio now has over $3 million in it. Um, and we have over 10,000 users that are using the fixed returns product now. And it, it is growing. It's something that's exciting uh, for our users. And, and we were very excited to launch it because it, we really went ahead to build it from user research. We talked to our users a lot to decide what we do. Um, and once we saw, you know, the kind of markets that last year was and even the previous year was, our users needed an alternative. They needed something else to engage with. And fixed returns was just that solution. So you've given great insight into your new product, fixed return. So what are your plans for future product development in terms of, I guess, new features or offerings? We are very focused on helping answering the question for users, I don't know what to buy. So one of the biggest questions that our users have today, like we said, um, is I don't know what to buy. We've been answering that question, you know, with webinars, with events that we organize, with investment guides that we syndicate. But now we're building an autopilot feature uh, that we're very excited about. So what it does is it allows you it provides you on your onboarding journey useful information that relates to your risk appetite and the type of investor that you are. And it provides education on different types of assets that match that risk appetite for you to make a decision. It also allows for you to set up like a dollar cost averaging feature where you can put a certain amount of money um, into a specific stock over time so that you can offset the movement in price um, that typically happens in the markets over the long term. So we're really excited about Autopilot. One of the new features that is coming up um, in the next quarter for our users. Um, we also have other features like leverage, which really gives some of our very active traders more leverage in the market to be able to invest more. Um, and take on positions even when they typically don't have liquidity for it in the moment. We have that and a bunch of other features that really is, is useful to our users. What we're really focused on is getting retail investing rights. And we've been talking to users, listening to them about what they want to have on the platform and what they want to see happen on the platform. Um, and, and a lot of that feedback is what we're building on now. And we're excited. Brilliant. So you've detailed or discussed your expansion of new features or products. So if you look at Bamboo as a company, what are your plans for expansion into new markets? We launched Ghana, I think, Q4 last year, which was our first international market. Uh, and now we're working on South Africa. In fact, we just closed an acquisition in, in South Africa that allows us to launch in that market. And it's pretty exciting. What we have seen is just the demand from launching in Nigeria and the work that we do, we get a lot of emails, you know, users in Ghana, in South Africa, in Kenya, and many of them come to us from our, from all the work we do around education. Because when we host uh, some of the events that we do, it's open to all. And then people come in from different countries to attend these events. And then after listening to all the insights that we share, the next question is, hey, are you launched in our market? Um, so we are pacing ourselves based off of that, based off of the demand that we are receiving from the market, also based off our ability to execute and operate in that market. Because to operate bamboo in any market, there are different things you need to work together. You need to be able to KYC, digitally KYC people at scale. You need to be able to digitally collect monies at scale. You need to be able to also get the regulators comfortable, provide some sort of regulatory engagement that allows them green light your operations. Um, so when we look at all these factors together, we work on them. And when they, we were able to get all these together, all these components, you know, signed off on, then we're able to launch in a new market. And we've been able to do that in Ghana. We're looking at South Africa. So a lot of progress has, has been done for South Africa and we're launching very soon. I think as soon as October, um, and then, and then right after that, we were looking at Kenya, right? So we're really focused on serving the demand that we're getting and following the demand as it comes to us. 
Fantastic. So you mentioned there that you get emails from users through the educational work that you do and the demand. So I was just wondering if we can go into a tiny bit more detail in terms of, in addition to this, what other factors influence your decision to enter a new market? So those factors, is one is demand. We want to make sure that we have tested the demand in the markets or engineered the demand by you know doing some education work, doing some insights that we syndicate. Uh, once we are satisfied that we've done our market sizing, market analysis and validated the demand, then we look at, okay, our partners, do we have partners that we can rely on for KYC? Uh, do we have partners that we can rely on for money transmission, money movement? Then we look at the brokerage components. Do we have the ability to onboard those users for, you know, US accounts, right? And once all these factors are right, then we know that we can launch and then we start working on launching. But the biggest part of that is engaging regulators because we always want to launch with the backing and the approval and the green lighting of the reg- local regulators. So we, we start to engage them early and we get sort of like um, green light from them to go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. So you mentioned in terms of looking for suitable partners, the onboarding process, and also the demand trends. So sticking to the theme of trends, what trends are you seeing in Africa's wealth tech space that you're currently excited about? I think the trends I'm seeing is that there's a lot of interest from the younger generation, the Gen Zs. Yes. And I think that that's pretty powerful. Um, I think if I had the opportunity to start investing as early um, as some of these users are, I'll probably be much further ahead. <laughs> In my own personal journey. But I think that that's such a pretty powerful thing. And when you think about it, when you think about like, where would the next 1 million investors out of Africa come from? How would that milestone be reached? This is where it becomes possible because we have a very large, young population in the continent, right? And if we can get it right with that generation, if we can educate them, empower them to have a better relationship with their money, I think that then we have secured our future. And then, you know, they can have, you know, pass on the same to the generation after them and the generation after them. And when you see even investment trends in the U.S. and how people get into investing, it typically starts from their parents buying stocks here and there um, when they're young. And then they grow up and the kids grow up and then they take over the accounts and or they even learn something along that journey. But it starts pretty early. And that's why, you know, the, the U.S. market is so huge and deep and the liquidity is, is incredible. I think we can be able to replicate that kind of movement in Africa. Obviously, with the technology that we have now, and that's what technology does, it allows us to leapfrog a lot of, you know, the components of it, right? So if Bamboo can be successful at raising 1 million Gen Z investors over the next few years, or 2 million or 5 million investors, active investors in the markets, I think that's such a pretty powerful thing, right? Um, And that's really what we're going after. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So you've detailed that the trend that you're seeing that you're excited about is the interest of the younger generation who are the future of Africa. So keeping to the theme of the future of Africa, where do you see Africa's investment space, say, in the next five years? I think that we would have more interoperability between the African capital markets and the global capital markets. I think we'll be able to see that as an African in Nigeria, you can easily access the Johannesburg Stock Exchange uh, or the Ghanaian Stock Exchange or the Kenyan Stock Exchange, as well as the U.S. Stock Exchange or the Stock Exchanges in Asia or the London Stock Exchange, all being possible with a few clicks, right? And that's what is really powerful because what has happened with technology and the internet that has made the whole world a little village, has brought everyone together, yes. broken down the barriers, Um all of that is what a lot of businesses has translated and, you know, to accelerate their economy, to accelerate even things as simple as um, purchasing power. If people be able to, you know, have their wealth grow in a way that is sustainable, where you can actually get net returns when you have macroeconomic climates that feature like double digit inflations, that feature devaluations. You really want to be able to look at your money and ensure that on a net basis, you're actually growing your wealth. 
And what Bamboo is able to do is make that possible, is make that type of future possible. And if we think about it again, that, okay, is there such a team that can come up with a milestone or a goal to say we want, over the next five years, we want 5 million investors out of Africa. I think Bamboo is well positioned to do that. And I think that that type of goal is what we see that will be possible over the next five years, is that there'll be more people investing. The continent will be richer um, the individual household income will be more just because we get people investing. If we bring it back and look closer to home, where do you see yourself and Bamboo in five years' time? Um, in five years, I think that we'll be a, very, a much larger company than we are now. I think we'll be in more African markets, serving more Africans. We'll be able to have learned a lot more about the individual Africans' journey and their work and their relationship with money would have been able to enable more Africans to invest, to learn and understand about money, asset classes, risk, uh, reward, um, and help them make better money decisions. I think the impact of that would trickle down into many things. I think, you know, the solution to poverty in Africa is really just having you know, the group of people that are in the labor force have better ways to invest their money. And all of that trickles down into, you know, people being able to have money to start new businesses, people being able to just have, you know, money to do a lot of things. So I think that our success is very much tied to the future of the future wealth of Africa, right? And if we execute correctly, which we hope to do and we are, uh, we would see that the continent would be a, you know, a better place to live and to, to invest from over the next five years, and so help me God. Quote of the week. As people, we often have quotes, mantras, even African proverbs and affirmations that keep us going when times are hard or when times are good. Do you have one that you can share with us today? I think there are many that I have that really help me in my own life. But I think the more relevant one here will be a story that I heard many years ago about two people that went, I can't remember the exact details, but they went into a market and then they saw that a lot of people didn't wear shoes. I think it was a shoe sales, two salesmen went to a market. One, oh, people here don't wear shoes, so we don't have a business here because they don't wear shoes. Um, and then the other said, wow, everyone here doesn't wear shoes. We can build a big business here. <laughs> um, so I think the mantra is there's a jewel in the stone sort of thing where you can look at Africa today and think it's plagued with a lot of problems. You know, things are fragmented. There are a lot of issues to solve for. But I think therein lies the opportunity, yes. you know, for entrepreneurs and for maybe people listening to the podcast today is that if you look at the problems, therein lies the opportunity. The, the jewel is in the stone. So um, you just got to go for it. Fantastic. And what a way to close today's conversation. So before we go... I was wondering, do you have any closing remarks, any final calls to action for people who are interested in the investment space or just interested in the work that you're doing at Bamboo? I think I would say a shameless plug. If you're listening, just go to your app store and download the Bamboo app and uh, let us help you on your investment journey and reach your dreams. Brilliant. That has been an awesome conversation. It's clear you've created an exciting company and financial products which have the potential of being game changers on the continent. So I'm looking forward to keeping an eye to seeing how things develop. So thank you for joining me on the podcast today, Richmond. Thank you, Tessa, for having me. It's a pleasure. It's been a pleasure having you. And we will speak soon. Alrighty. Bye-bye. Thank you to everyone who has listened and stayed tuned to the podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, share or tell a friend about it. You can also rate, review us in Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast. Thank you and see you next week for the Unlocking Africa podcast. <laughs>